now. So we're continuing, like I said, and Psalm 23 is one of those psalms that's probably familiar to you, even if you didn't grow up in a church background. Probably if you've ever gone to a funeral service, uh, you probably had the preacher or pastor speak from this, um, this chapter, and I promise you hopefully it'll be a little, more, a little better than going to a funeral. Uh, but Psalm 23... It's probably used in uh, your, your home decor somewhere. You, walk, you can't walk into a Hobby Lobby and not see Psalm 23 somewhere uh, on a wood plank or shiplap or a coffee mug, you know what I'm saying? So it's everywhere. Uh, and so it, it's, it's a big chapter. It's a big song. That's what it is. It, it's a song of declaration. Remember, that's what we've been talking about, what the Psalms are. They're really just kind of poems and songs and things put to music. And so that's what Psalm 23 is. So what we're going to do, we're going to just read through it, and then we're going to break it down like we normally do, and we'll see what God does with it. All right? So here we go. He says, The Lord is my shepherd. This is David. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Some versions say, I shall not want. And I think right there, that's a bold statement, right at the get-go. Let's say, The Lord is my shepherd. I don't want anything else. And that's, that's my hope for my life, that's my hope for our church, that no matter what circumstance comes, situation that we walk through, either good or bad, the Lord is our shepherd that is watching over us, and I don't need anything else. I am completely satisfied. So that he's setting the tone right out the gate of how he feels about the Lord. And he says in verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Let's pray, and we'll dive in. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for just the music and the songs that we got to sing this morning, just declaring your truth and your goodness over us. God, I pray that Psalm 23 would be the very thing that David used it for, just a song of declaration of who you are, that you protect us. You, you are all that we need. God, we pray that for our church and our lives and our families. In Jesus' name, amen. So, it's six verses. It's a short song. Everybody likes a short song, all right? Six verses. But these six verses, it teaches us some really these profound truths about loving a loving God. And not only just a loving God, but a protective God. And some of you guys are dads in here. And some of you have daughters in here. I don't have daughters. I have three boys. But even with my, my young kids, like there's this protectiveness that I have for them, even at a young age. And then when they, I'm sure when they become teenagers, if you have a teenage daughter, it's like you, 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 like you won't kill somebody, all right? If you look at my daughter the wrong way, I'm going to hurt you, all right? So it's this protectiveness, and that's what David is declaring who God is for us, that the enemy is approaching, the enemy has surrounded us, but God is going to fight for us. And so King David, that's who he is, we're, we're hearing from a king, he, he lived in danger most of his life. A lot of us think we got a lot going on, but David had a lot going on because he had a lot of danger that was surrounding him almost every day. He was facing enemies. He was facing people within his own encampment, his own army that was out to kill him. We mentioned earlier that his son was out to kill him and to dethrone him, so he had a lot of stuff going on, all right? He feared for his life, and so what he did is he got to a place in his walk with the Lord that he depended on the words and the promises of God like we do oxygen. Like with the air that we breathe, that's what David needed. He needed God in his life as we do oxygen. He depended on God. And what's funny is that in the Psalm, Psalm 22, which we're not going to cover today, but you see the whole difference of how we see Psalm 23 is like, I lack nothing. God, you are everything. You are, you are all that I need. You protect me. You, you lead me to still waters. You love me. And if you look at, at, at Psalm 23, let me just read you just a, a little bit from 23, or 22. He says this in, in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Very words that Jesus said on the cross. Why are you so, so far from saving me? Psalm 22 says, everywhere I look, people are trying to kill me. 
That was just a few, that was just a chapter before. So he, had a, he wrote a song about, God, where are you? Hello? I got all this stuff going on. People are trying to kill me. And now he's gone from, God, you are everything. I don't need anything else. I just need you. The fear is gone. So what happens? He paints this picture in, in Psalm 23, this beautiful, even this serene picture, a shepherd walking sheep beside a calm stream and then leading them to this green grass where they can eat, where they can sleep, where they can just rest. And so even in the midst of a, this low point in his life, because it's still low, he still has a lot going on, he's putting his hope and trust in the Lord. And much like we talked about a few weeks ago in Psalm 16, that, that David believes that, that God can satisfy our every need. In Psalm 22, David compared the enemy to, to animals that are after them that are clever and strong, but in this psalm, he pictured God, and he pictured us really as these defenseless sheep, that we are defenseless. We can't defend ourselves against the enemy. We can't. From the powers of darkness, we can't defend it by ourselves. The only way we can defend it is if the Holy Spirit indwells in us. That's how we defend darkness. And so we see that in 22, we see that in 23, and you begin to think, okay, why, why, so, why is it so important that we would learn from a shepherd? Shepherds were the lowliest of low in that culture. They were dirty. They stunk. They didn't make a lot of money. They, they just grazed and roamed everywhere. Nobody really wanted to be associated with shepherds. And here David says right out the gate that the Lord, you are my shepherd. But shepherds, they, you can imagine they took care of their flock no matter what. They would be willing to sacrifice their own life to protect the flock. Because notice what it says in verse 2. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet, or some versions say, still waters. And so this gives us a picture of God that gives us a rest, a God that gives us rest and also God that leads us to peace. And that's something that we're all longing for is peace. We sing about it at Christmas, a peace on earth, but right now in July, Lord, just give us peace. What I'm going through, Lord, I just, I'm searching for peace. I long for peace. Because our lives, you and I both know that they get a little chaotic. You know, you got vacations. You got some, the kids are at home all day. And you got work schedules and all these different things. And everything's so chaotic and busy. Everybody's busy. You know, anytime you ask somebody, hey, hey how, how are things going? Oh, we're just busy. Every time. No matter what. You do it too. I do it too. So the goal is, if somebody asks how you're doing, just be real. Don't say, wow, just think you're busy. Yeah, everybody's busy, but what's going on? Anyway, that was a soapbox. But anyway, here we, here we go. It's chaotic. It's crazy. And like when you go on vacation, the, the days leading up to going on vacation, especially if you have kids, you're packing and the, and the packing is something like you, like that's when you get to a place where like, okay, suitcases are filled, the car or headed to the airport, everything's loaded, everything's checked in, whatever. You load up the, the SUV or the van and you head down the interstate. It's like, okay, I need, I need this. I need a vacation. Then you go on vacation. And then for some reason, when you come back from vacation, you need a vacation from going on vacation. You know what I'm saying? It's like when we go to Disney World, you know? Everybody ever been to Disney World? Bunch of pagans. But anyway, we could have, if you go to Disney World, what happens is you spend all day at the, at the parks and you do this and do that, ride all the rides, eat all the food, and you come home. And what happens? You're exhausted. It's like, what did we spend $8 million to do for the past week? And I'm more exhausted than I was before we left. But it's so fun. It's so magical. I get it, all right? But listen, all of us... Our lives are chaotic. Our lives are crazy. We are longing for peace in our life. These still, calm waters. Uh, a few times I've gone down the, uh, if you've ever been, or gone on a whitewater rafting down the Ocoee River or out in Colorado or wherever it may be, and you think of the, the rapids and you think of the whitewater, and if you've ever gone whitewater rafting, if you've ever done that, anybody ever done that? few adventurous souls, okay. 
But you, what they do is they give you the, you give you a helmet, they give you a life jacket, then they give you the paddle, all right? And you remember what you have to do, the one thing they preach to you all day long is about what about the paddle? Anybody remember? What's the thing at the, at the end that you have to hold on to? The T-grip. Never let go of the T-grip. No matter how crazy the water gets, how rapid the rapids get, never let go of the T-grip. And I remember I was 15 years old, all right, just some punk kid, all right? Hey, don't let go of the T-grip. Never let go of the T-grip. So we get down, it's, and it, it's like our family vacation, all right? And my parents are here so I can t- talk about them, but we go down the Ocoee, five minutes in, I got my T-grip, I got my helmet, I'm 15 or whatever, and boom, we hit that first set of rapids, and, it, and this is like my first time doing it, and I just simply freak out. Ever freak out? Happened to me, went 15, all right? And what do I do? The first moment that we hit the first rapid, I'm, I'm in the first kind of row, and my dad's directly behind me in the second row, and so we hit that rapid, and what do I do? I freak out, and instead of holding it like this, I hold it like this, like some moron, all right? And I hit a rock, and my paddle goes behind me and knocks my dad in the nose, and he's got a bloody nose pretty much the whole trip down the river. Again, you need a vacation from the vacation. Now that I'm a dad, it's like, okay, yeah, I understand why he was mad the rest of the day. I get that. But we're, we're searching and longing for what? We want calm waters. And that's what the Lord is leading us to. And a lot of times our anxieties bring on this noise of toxicity. And we, we breathe in and take in all these toxic lies that we're, we watch on the news and YouTube and all these different things that, that feed into us. And it's easy for us to fall into this buying into this false narrative and buying into this even control of how we think and how we do things. So it makes me kind of ask myself, and I'll ask you this this morning, who is it that's leading you? I mean, really, think about it. Who is it that's leading? I'm not going to get all crazy, fundamental, like, you know, what kind of music you listen to, what kind of mu- movies you watch, and all these different things. But seriously, like, what is it that is leading you? What is it that's leading you? Is it the things that we watch, the things that we listen to, the things that we, that we read and follow? Or is it the truth that God has for us in our life? Because it's so easy to buy into that stuff, to see the, that stuff, to believe that stuff, and say, okay, they are trying to lead my life, and we go down a path that we never thought we would go. Because we're not allowing the shepherd to guide and lead us. Don't find yourself being led by the wrong thing. We got to be able to put some guards up. And trusting in the Lord, that's the, very, that's the T-grip that we've always got to hold on to. When we feel overwhelmed and we fear, feel fearful, God reminds us that his role in your life is to lead you to peace. To lead you to peace. That's what he wants to do. That's what he's trying to do. He wants to lead you to a calm place where you don't have to freak out. That you can trust him. That he is the one that leads us. Because here's the deal. Jesus spilled and poured out his blood on the cross on Golgotha's dust so that we could lie down in a green pasture. Does it make sense? What Christ did for us, the blood that was shed on Calvary, that was done so that we would have the opportunity to lie down in a peace, calm, green pasture. And he goes on the same verse 3. He says, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Nothing else should fill that role in your life. Notice how it says, it doesn't say, at the end of verse 3, it doesn't say for David's namesake. It doesn't say for Noah's namesake. It doesn't say for Trey's namesake. For Christ, for God's namesake. That he would get the glory. He would get the praise. And nothing else should fill that role. Because in our weakest moments, we must have God on our side. Because listen, he's fighting for you every single day. He's fighting for you and against the darkness that you can't handle yourself. And then he goes on to say, even though I walk through the darkest valley. Some versions say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I take a look at my life and realize it's not. Stop. You know. Even my mama thinks that. Stop. Okay. I can't help. Like, I'm so, every time I read that, just Coolio goes through my mind. Anyway, we should just pray. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, he says, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I think the big thing here, what David is trying to communicate in this song, in this prayer, I don't think that it's simply that God comforts us, even though he does. Absolutely he does. I I don't think that God leads us, even though, yes, he does. I don't think the main thing is that God protects us, but yes, he does. I think what David is trying to get to here is that it teaches us that God is never going to give up on you, no matter what you're going through. It says, even though you've been in the desert, even though you're in your darkest point of your life, and you feel like you can never escape the desert, God never gives up on you. If you look back in verse 4, that's the one that, that everybody can probably quote, everybody, one that's, that's heard a lot. That's the one that, that, that they say at the funeral all the time. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this phrase, again, is so popular. But do we really know what David's trying to say here? Even though, Notice that. Even though, he begins, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, this is death that he's talking about. This, like, remember death, everything, every death, the very thing that all, all of us are afraid of. It's the greatest enemy of mankind. The, the place that every person will go and they'll go alone. Death stands off in the darkness, hunkering down in the shadows of our lives like some monster that we're all afraid of. It's terrible, it's lonely, it's fearful. But for some reason, it wasn't for David. Some reason, even though he had the enemy pushing in against him, even though that his son was out to kill him, he did not fear death. Why? I think because God is with us even in that dark moment. I do. Like some of you, I don't know all of your story. But it it may have taken every bit of you to come today. It may have taken every ounce of just energy that you have to be here. To get out of bed. Because you feel like it's not worth it. You feel like, man, there's, there's no use. Man, they're having fun in there. There's no use whatsoever. It's like, why? But you're here. And maybe it's for you to hear this word, not from me, but from Psalm 23, from the word of God, that even though life sucks right now, even though you don't know what the next step is, even though that you don't know what direction you should take, you, even though you're like, I don't know how I'm going to pay rent or the mortgage this month, even though like I just lost my job, I don't know what's next, even though it's like, I don't know if I should date this girl or not. You probably should because everybody else is going to say no. But even though, even though, even though, even though, in our darkest moment, God is right there with us. Even though. Even though you don't have it all together. Even though you're not perfect. Even though you're a wicked soul. He's still right there with us. That's where God does his, his best work. In our even those. See, the grace of God will find us. The grace of God is irresistible, and we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear evil anymore, because God is fighting for us. The Father, God, will not forsake us, just like Jesus wasn't left in the tomb. Jesus wasn't left in the tomb, and because he wasn't, he's not going to leave you alone either. You see, the tomb was the darkest place in Jesus' life. But God didn't leave him there. God will be with us. He's with us yesterday, now, and forever. Even in the shadow of death, even when death falls over us, 
That's when we need him most. Because a lot of us fear death. When you think about it, nobody wants to, it's like one of those things, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And I get it. Like, I'm right there with you. I think that's where the enemy attacks me the most at night. I start thinking about how I'm going to die. <laughs> Just a struggle of mine. If something starts to hurt, I'm like, oh, that's it. I'm going to die in my sleep. That's it. I didn't hug my kids tight enough. I didn't kiss my, my wife good enough. This is it. And I think my biggest fear is not so much of dying. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm a firm believer in glory. I'm a firm believer that Christ has a place for me, and he's prepared a place for me, and, I, and, and, and I'm going to dwell in that place forever. But there's a part of me that's like, ah, not yet. Not yet, Lord. I want to see my kids grow up. I want to see my friend's kids grow up. I want to go to my, my son's wedding. I, I just want to grow old with Samantha. You know, all those things that we long for. And there's this fear of what if my time on this earth is, is gone? God calls me home in my sleep, whatever it may be. Would I be okay with that? And that's what, that's what goes around in my mind a lot of times at night. That's why in Psalm 16, where it talks about the enemy coming at us at night, I can relate to that. But here's the thing. As much as I don't want to leave Samantha and Gentry Shepherd and, and Baylor and my friends and other family, like I, I know that once, once I get to heaven, let's just say that God calls me home tomorrow, and prophecy is not one of my gifts, so hopefully it doesn't happen, but let's just say, like, here's the thing. Once I, once I see Jesus face to face, like, I love my kids. As loud and crazy as they are, I love my wife. And I don't want this to sound like, man, come on. They won't even be a glimmer in my eye. They, they will not be something that I probably think about. Because when we're facing where we were created to be, there's no way we want to go back. And here's the thing. Here's the reality check that I have to explain to myself often. With my three sons and my wife, if, if the Lord calls me home, listen, Samantha and my boys, they don't need me. They don't. They don't need me. But what they need is a shepherd. What they need is a God that loves them that can lead them to still waters. That can lead them to truth and hope that they're longing for in their darkest moments. They don't need me. I'm just dad. They need a Lord. They need a savior. But a lot of us are fearful of death. Because even though if death, David said, even though if death comes, I'm not gonna fear it. I'm not gonna be afraid. God will be with us. Listen, it doesn't matter who you are or where you are. You can't escape the grace of God. You can't. You can curse his name. And grace is still offered to you. You know why? Because you took that next breath. That's why. You woke up the next morning. That's the grace of God. God in his grace is able to be there with you. In the midst of the pain and the uncertainty and in the, in the high of the blessing and the cheer, he's with you. His grace will find you. And so he says, even though, and I think this phrase shares a lot of good news for us. And I keep going back, I mean, even every time that, even today, like I'm reading it this morning and reading it now, every time that I, that I see those two words, even though it takes me back to the cross. That even though his, Jesus' pain was excruciating, even though we didn't believe him, even though the people around him mocked him, they cursed his name, even though that people had given up on him, even though all those things, Jesus still stayed on the cross. Do, do you realize that, like, I need you to understand, like, if... If Jesus himself, when he was nailed to the cross, if at any moment that says, man, this is really uncomfortable and I want to get off this thing and go back home, at any moment he could have done that. But he chose to stay on the cross 
even though our lives wouldn't be perfect, even though it had been months that we prayed to him, even though we hadn't been to church since last Easter, even though all these different things, even though, even though, even though he stayed on the cross. Why? Because he loves us that much. Despite our faults, he wants to offer us grace and hope and love because we need it. And notice what it says in verse 5. He says, he went from the shepherd, now he goes to host. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So what he's doing here is David is, is switching from portraying Yahweh, Lord, as a shepherd to portraying him as a host. As a host. Now, give, let me give you some cultural context there. Anytime in the ancient Near East that people would have people over at their house or over to their house for dinner or whatever it may be, like you were basically, you were responsible for protecting them. It was your responsibility. If someone entered your house as a guest, you were responsible. You were willing, saying, if you enter into their house, you're willing to lay down your life to protect your guests. That's the cultural context of what's going on here. So he says, even in the presence of my enemies, you have prepared a table for me and you invited me into a place. You see, the host was responsible for protecting their guests. So since David, as the guest, enjoys Yahweh's protection, he can eat safely in the presence of his enemies. And he doesn't have to fear. And then he goes on to say, he says, you anoint my head with what? With oil. Another cultural thing. When somebody would enter into the home, what they would do is they would, they would anoint their head with oil, with olive oil. Could you imagine if we did that today? Could you imagine? Like, Samantha, no one's coming over. Get the canola out. Let's go. Get it out. The vegetable oil. We don't have olive oil. We're now, it's 20. Get the avocado oil out, please. We've got guests coming over. But it was a sign of blessing them. It was a sign of we have prayed over you. We have prayed protection over you. We, we anoint you with oil. So it was this customary practice. When a host would, would welcome people into their house, they not only had to protect them, but they wanted to anoint them as they, if they were blessed by the Lord. And so the Lord, again, wants to bless you. That's what David is saying. That the Lord continues to bless my life in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the valley that I find myself in. And I think a lot of us get sidetracked when it comes to God's blessing in our life. Hear me out when I say this. Now, it, it is some, sometimes this way, but a lot of times when we, when we say God has blessed me, usually it revolves around two things. Anytime you hear stories of, man, God's really blessed me. Either it's blessed me with good health or blessed me with what? Money. Anytime we get that random insurance check in the mail, it's like 400 bucks. Like, where did this come from? Like, we overpaid for something that we never knew that. It's like, oh, it's a blessing from the Lord. Is it, though? Or just somebody screwed up? Or you overpaid? Now, I will say, like, yes, money and can be a blessing for sure, absolutely. But the blessing of the Lord, when the Lord blesses you in your life, Jesus doesn't bless you with his 401k. Does, Jesus doesn't bless you with putting something in your bank account randomly. He blesses you with himself. That's it. That's what David means, like, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't want anything else. Keep your money. Keep your health. Like, I have Jesus, and that's all that I need. It reminds me what Peter said in Acts chapter 3. He says, gold and silver I have not, but I come in the name of the Lord, Jesus. Now rise up and walk. Don't fall into this trap of what God's blessing for your life is if you're obedient to the Lord, that God's going to bless you financially. It's not in there. As much as they want to push that narrative, it's not in there. The blessing of the Lord is the Lord himself. That's it. Like, we've, we've created this culture where eternal life is simply not enough anymore. Loving, our, loving us despite our false, faults and our screw-ups and how dumb we are isn't enough anymore. God, we want money. We want health. We want prosperity. No, that's not the gospel of Jesus. So don't fall for that trap. 
Jesus wants to give you hope when all seems lost. When all else fails, Jesus will succeed. That's the truth of the gospel. Jesus can give you the satisfaction that you can't find at your job. Jesus can give you a life of blessing for himself. David is saying here, as he finishes this psalm, listen, what he's, as he finishes this, how does he finish it? He says, dwell. That world dwell, just being with the Father, being with the Lord, being with Jesus. He says in verse 6, surely your goodness and love will follow me. It doesn't say will leave me. It doesn't say will come back when I need it. It says God's love will follow you, will follow me all the days of my life. Not just on weekends, not just on Sunday mornings from 10 to about 1130. No. No. All the days of my life, and I'll be, I, because of that, will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's how he wraps it up. But when you look back at how he starts this whole thing, remember how he starts? He says, the Lord is what? My shepherd. Why does David find hope, comfort, and strength in God the shepherd rather than God the righteous judge or the warrior king? You think about that? The shepherd, this lowly position. But the shepherd of Psalm 23 is the conquering hero of the future. That's what we have to understand. And we see that when we go to the end of the book. I don't mean the end of Psalm, I mean in Revelation. When the end is near, I love what Revelation 7 says, and we have it on the screen. He talk about the shepherd. Why does he follow the shepherd? Why does he trust the shepherd? It says, he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their, what? Shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Listen, church family, in that day, God will finally defeat and destroy every threat and every fear we could imagine. We follow a victorious shepherd, a victorious God. The truth is, God will be a terrifying God to those that oppose him. Our shepherd, our God will be a righteous, perfect, holy God that will judge the earth. And that should be terrifying for those that oppose the gospel. Because and us who, who dwell in the house of the Lord will experience a peace that none of us could ever imagine. Therefore, we, the weak and the defenseless sheep, that's who we are. We do not want, we shall not want, we don't need anything because we have been delivered from every dark valley that we've seen, that we've met. So listen, we dwell with Jesus. If life is tough right now, dwell with Jesus. If you don't know what the next step is in your life, dwell with Jesus. If you're so confused on what your identity is, dwell in Jesus. Listen, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the truth for us. That's the truth that, that Psalm 23 is trying to lay out for us. That you don't need anything else. That Jesus is enough. Jesus is the one that's going to pull you out of that pit, out of that valley. So we dwell with the Lord. That's our hope. That's where we find peace. And so today, as we kind of end our time, that no one then we're going to lead us in one more song, just kind of a, a time of response. But um, we're going to take communion today. Now, while we're singing this last song, we'll pass out the elements to you. And, but I need you to understand that the, the magnitude of communion. It's something, you know, we don't do it every Sunday. And the reason we don't do it every Sunday, not that it's good or bad to do it every Sunday, but I feel like if we did it every Sunday, it would just become a habit. Just something that we do. Eat the dry cracker, drink the grape juice, go home. But after we read Psalm 23 and that we have a God that's protecting us, that a shepherd that 
like an unblemished, perfect lamb, went to be slaughtered for our future, for our eternal life. Again, we didn't deserve anything, but God gave us everything through His perfect Son, Jesus. And you may be sitting here, it's like, you know, I've never, I've never followed Jesus. Like, I've been to church a few times. I've got, you know, I bought that same thing from Hobby Lobby. It's hanging in my foyer. I get that. But you've never truthfully followed Christ. Maybe today's the day. Maybe today's the day. That you're going through the darkest valley today, right now. This is the season that you're in. And you need an antidote. You need an answer. It's not me. It's not a church building. It's Jesus. That's it. Jesus, again, plus nothing, is everything you need. Everything you need. If you say, if you say today is the day I want to follow Jesus, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of chasing after things that don't matter. I'm tired of trying to find peace and hope and everything that the world throws at me. Simply do this right here in your seat. Right there in your street. Scripture tells us that if we confess to the Lord that we're sinful, that we're not perfect, and then we are in need of a Savior. So right there in your seat, it, eyes open, eyes closed, whatever it may be, if you're watching online, whatever, whatever it may be for you. But today's the day. It's like, you know what? I want to follow Jesus. I'm tired of running. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he went to a cross on your behalf, that he died for you, that he stayed on the cross for you, but he didn't stay in the tomb for you. So you believe that he went to a cross for you to die, to die for you, and you believe that he's alive today. Just pray that prayer right there where you're sitting. Jesus, I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I'm in need of a Savior. God, become my shepherd. God, I believe that you went to a cross. I believe that you're alive today, and I turn away from myself, God, and I want to surrender my life to you. Now hear me out when I say this. You could pray that prayer and mean it with everything that you have and tomorrow morning you may wake up and your life still may suck. But listen, Jesus is right there with you, fighting with you, fighting for you. And you have a place to dwell. And you don't have to dwell on the past. You don't have to dwell with the circumstance that you're in right now. You can dwell with the Lord. And that's the hope that you need.